couple suggestions for um, the way that labs can um, continue in a certain way. Um, on the activity sheet, you've noticed, and this is a new thing that we've been doing over the course of the summer, is trying to crowdsource some tips, suggestions, um, and questions from you. So if you have questions or suggestions or problems that you're having um, in your own lab experience, feel free to go ahead and put those um, into this space. People that are here in the lab, we'll try to over here on the on the on the right side, try to give some responses and some tips, even links that you maybe have found um, that you would like to share out. Keep going down the activity sheet. We have um, a few frequently asked questions. Some of these have actually come up um, in the instructional or in the um, uh, vice provost town halls as well. And a lot of these questions were put together by uh, Blair Bundy and Amber Smith, who were actually on the call today. So maybe Blair and Amber, if you'd like to jump in, introduce yourselves, and sort of give your uh, perspectives and back background about um, labs and clinical experiences at UW for the coming fall term. Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? This is Blair. Yeah, I'm here, Blair. Great. For some reason, I can't seem to turn my video on. Um, no worries, though, but it won't seem to allow me. But anyway, um, so yeah, my name is Blair Bundy, and I'll just give some real just brief background, and then uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to Amber to kind of share the work that she's been doing. So the reason that Amber and I um, are here, in addition to um, just the great work that happens in the active teaching labs, is um, I've been a part of the... Um, COVID phase two planning team. There's a number of teams that are focusing on continuity of instruction. And the team that I've been a part of is working on the re-engagement of field and clinical activities. And so that's every setting you can imagine. And there's a lot of settings that UW-Madison students um, that we want to make sure are re-engaged in the fall. And that would be um, anything from clinics and hospitals to community settings, agricultural settings. Uh, we have students all over, um, well, all over the state um, all over the nation and all over the world who are engaged in all kinds of outreach and um, these field placement activities. And so I'm happy to share the work that we've been doing. Um, and I'll pass it to Amber, who's been working on a very similar track, which is on the re-engagement of laboratory uh, uh, lab courses. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amber Smith. I'm the Associate Director in WIS Science, and I've been leading a team of people to work on solutions and strategies to be used in lab courses. Uh, we really spanned courses that, because of size and other limitations, know that they needed to go fully remote right away, so figuring out how do we do hands-on work in a remote setting, to some courses that now have been choosing and able to come back in person and what does that look like to have physically distant work. And so my team has come up with um, really a lot of strategies and things that we hope will translate and be applied uh, across all STEM disciplines. I think I'll just pause there so we have lots of time for questions and getting into individual uh, questions and ideas. All right, and can everybody hear me now? Just do a little thumbs up or raise your hand or something if you can. Yes, thank you, Seth. All right, so y'all can hear me, and I think you can all see the application, the activity sheet that we have right now. So just to reiterate what, what's been said already as I was sort of missing um, in action, we have, this is, the Active Teaching Labs are, are in many ways, they're, they're a problem-solving situation here, right? We walk into the classrooms or we walk into our learning environments and we sort of have the learning environment that we have and we have to figure out how do we teach effectively and efficiently in this learning environment. So today we're going to focus on what are the things that we can do with the knowledge that we have. Recognize, I'm, I'm sure that you all recognize this very, very deeply, things might change again because that's what happened you know, last month, last week, last spring, last semester, things are changing. And they're changing even faster now as we're, we're getting into things. So with that huge disclaimer, what are our plans? What can we do? One of the things that I really want to focus on and, and stress 
is this idea of the Wisconsin experience. This is really a great opportunity for us to, you know, have that intellectual confidence to jump forward with the best that we can do. Recognize also that our empathy and humility is really going to be needed as we have students that are really struggling and they don't know what to do and they have uncertainty and they have anxiety. And in many ways, we're being asked to do things that we've never had to do before. And we, sh we should do those. We need to be relentlessly curious, curious about what's happening, what can happen, what can we learn from other institutions, our colleagues, what can we learn from our students who are in other classes so that we don't get this narrow vision of, oh, this is only what happens in my class, this is it. Ask your students about things and have enlist them in that. The idea of purposeful action, right? We're all sort of in this and we've got to do the best that we can because we believe in what we're doing. That's why we are instructors here at UW-Madison. So those are sort of the big things. I've got a bunch of information here um, that we've all put together, as JT said, on the activity sheet. And I guess I want to start off with some questions. And we've got, in addition to, I, I hope you'll take a look at these frequently asked questions here because they will get you started. If there are any of these questions that you say these answers are not deep enough or whatever, and I want to talk about them more, grab them and re-put them up here because we're happy to talk about them. If we run out of space in the table again, just start another row and, and add your own line. Um, and again, if you have solutions or ideas or you've talked with your teaching team about, oh, I know how to handle this one because we've been talking about it and we have some ideas, please, in this right-hand column, share those ideas. All right. I want to start off right away with um, letting anybody who has a, a burning question, even more burning than, than what's being listed here or in the frequently asked questions, raise your hand and ask it and we can start off with that. The labs again are very, we, we try to be as responsive to your questions and needs as possible. So rather than starting off with a set curriculum that's sort of canned and first we're going to do this, then we're going to do this, we really do want to answer your questions so that you don't leave thinking, well, they didn't answer my question that I didn't have a chance to share. So any burning questions that you want to share, go ahead and raise your hand and we will call on you. Okay, well, that invitation is open for the rest of the session, so feel free to do so as, as the spirit moves you, as they might say. And we can start off with some of these um, initial questions. Should we just go from the top and, and work our way down? And I'm happy to talk a little bit about them with my best effort, or Amber and uh, Blair, if you want to unmic and jump in and and answer as well, that would be great as, as well. So for the first one here, how can I be sure that students achieve the intended learning objectives? Um, so my best guess, and I'm going to I'm going to point out a few things here. Um, we've got this section here with uh, we say, we call it reassess with backwards design, but this really talks about some of the outcomes and um, options that you might have. So here are some of them, and this is just like three examples, and we know that there are a lot more that you might have. Um, are there any specific op learning objectives that you want help, whoever wrote that question, that you want help in, in answering? And as you think about this, I, I want to sort of push back on this word, the intended learning objectives, this phrase, right? We're in a weird time right now. And if you think about authentic learning that is happening in whatever field you're in, I will guarantee you that it probably had, <laughs> guarantee probably, it probably, they're probably struggling with how are we going to do business, our intended objectives, how are we going to do our intended objectives in this weird state that we're in where we're physically distanced and People are working from home. People are attending classes from home. 
when they are attending classes in person, they don't exhibit the same collegiality uh, as we've had in the past. So all of that is so different, right? So what you can do, and, and I have this in my thing above, enlist the students because this is a real thing and it's authentic learning in your discipline, whatever your discipline is. The intended learning objectives of last year, in some ways, they're changed, right? Because you've got that in COVID times added to it right now. This is an opportunity whether, um, and it's not a great one, but it, it is an opportunity to say, what are the real problems that we're having right now in our field and how can we work with them? Get your students enlisted in that. Um, and that will, that I, I think is, 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 is one really um, useful way to sort of pivot. And I think your students will be open to that because it's a tough time and they recognize that. So be open and honest and, and say, hey, this is really, our, our struggle is different than normal semesters. Um, people talk about students losing out on the standard standard um, learning that they might have had in previous semesters. But on the other hand, they've got some, you know, high stress, panic situation, environment simulations, if you will, that are not really simulations that they're having to deal with right now. So this is in some ways a stronger uh, learning, different, but it's a pretty strong learning environment. Blair, go ahead. Yeah, so John, I appreciate um, all of those sort of big picture of framing um, almost the kind of the principles that that you're that you're walking us through for the Wisconsin idea. I, I want to just um, you know in this first question, which is how can we be sure that students achieve the intended learning outcomes? One of the things that my team has been very focused on is safety and safety protocols for re-engaging in these face-to-face -face activities. And the way that Steve Kramer, who, um, you know, our Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, well, former v VPTL, who is now the Vice Provost for Instructional Continuity and Academic Affairs, the way that he has talked about these experiences is having a very engaging and successful face-to-face -face experience. And so from the field clinical course perspective, the team that I've been working on, Almost all of the work that we have been um, to this point, and it's only been a few, uh, five weeks, six weeks that we've been working on this, is to create these guidelines for safely re-engaging in these face-to-face -face field placement activities. And one of the things that I'm really looking to this group, the Active Teaching Lab community, is to help me to start thinking about the pedagogical aspects of that, right? We just, my team has not had the time to really be thinking about that. And so I'm really looking to this community to help me generate these questions that either I can respond to in real time during this session or take back to my team to try to address. And so when I think about this question about the intended learning outcomes, the way that we've written the guidelines and everything that I'm referring to is on the instructional continuity website for both the lab materials, for the field course materials, um, if you go to the Instructional Continuity website, you'll see some course design tools, and that's where you'll find the materials that Amber and I have been working on. And one of the things that we have indicated is that there is a point person for each one of these field placements who can be that liaison between the field placement site and between um, the students who are engaged in those activities. And in some cases, thank you for pulling that up, John. Thank you very much. In, or whoever's pulling that up. Um, That's me. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Um, in each, each of these cases, there is a designated person who has been identified as either the faculty member, the site coordinator, who is responsible for ensuring that students are, one, safely engaging these activities, but are also providing that kind of feedback for those observable behaviors in the field, right? So they're kind of playing this multi-purpose uh, role of, of ensuring that 
students are successfully engaged in the proper wearing of PPE and the safety precautions, but also that they're meeting those learning objectives. And for me, that's that's the richness of, of engaging with all of you is to kind of think through, well, what are the things that 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 instructors in this new environment need to be thinking about? So so there are people who are in place that are going to be providing feedback to students as they progress through their activities and meeting those learning objectives. Um, and this is one of those moments where I almost feel like we're anticipating how they're going to do that, but the the reality of it, we're not going to get into that until you know we roll up our sleeves and are back in some of those sites, which are already happening in the clinical environment for sure. And I guess I'll stop there and get any reactions or allow others to kind of speak to that as well. Yeah, and JT has his hand up right now, so go ahead, JT. In the this is sort of a general question, specifically to you, Blair, as well. Um, in the current predicament and climate that we're in, what happens? I guess what is the the plan B for when a, if a student falls ill in in a field class or a lab? Um, you know, traditionally, I guess the instructors would work with that. Sort of what is the scenario B or the caveat for that um, students? engagement in the course, or the instructor for that matter. Blair or Amber, did you talk about plan Bs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things, John, in the site that you just had up a, a minute ago, there's a mm -hmm. PDF table that's listed in there that has the steps for um, if, if there is, um, someone, whether the student or the instructor, develops um, COVID or comes into contact with someone who has had COVID. And so we've created a, uh, uh, it, it's a PDF table that lists out what are those steps for that plan B approach. Okay. And um, folks can go find that on the instructional continuity site. Very good. Yeah, and I can also add that right into the answer. Oh, thank you. And Amber, you were um, about to say something? Yeah. Oh, I, I guess I was going to. So from the lab course perspective, we haven't delineated a link. Uh, sorry, a, like part B for any one particular situation, but I think regardless of what discipline you're teaching in, any in-person class, I think the instructor should be thinking of some plan Bs. I don't mean to say you're planning your whole experience of what that might look like remote, but um, for me, if I had a student that was missing a significant piece, I think I would really come back to the learning objectives and try to understand or think of ways that they could still meet that. So for example, if they were not able to come to class to gather data, could they use data from another group or data that had been collected in a previous semester and still go through the analysis part of it. Of course, they wouldn't be getting the hands-on part, um, but as you mentioned in the beginning, the semester above all is gonna have to be about flexibility um, and being um, you know, kind of mindful there. I do wanna note that I have a colleague, um, Michelle Rondon, that I believe is still on here, and she has been teaching quite a few um, remote labs and Michelle I just want to invite if you have any experiences from the summer or spring that uh, you might be able to speak to that that you're more than welcome to jump in. Um, hello yeah I, I taught a lecture and a lab class this summer remotely um, and I did notice students had a lot of issues keeping up with everything every Either they were taking too many classes or they had jobs, but I've never in about 10 years of teaching have so many students who needed accommodations as this summer. So I think it is quite a shift for a lot of students. Yeah, and, and um, it, it seems to me that like this idea of being flexible, um, sort of extending the standard timelines that you might have where, you know, in a normal semester, you have to finish the uh, exam time in X amount of time, right? Recognizing that people's bandwidth is different, that some people are 
um, taking care of, you know, family members or sick families or, or, you know, we've got all kinds of things happening right now and you do not know what your students are dealing with at the moment. Now, in a classroom situation, I'm sorry, this is for remote learning specifically, but in a classroom situation, you can see that everybody's there, and although you can't see what's going on in their mind or what they're thinking of, the stresses that they're dealing with there, sometimes you can see like the worried look on their faces, etc. But in a remote situation, for sure, you, you do not know. So whatever extra time or flexibility uh, flexibilities that you can uh, give your students and build into your class, I think would be a, a really useful thing. I want to point out, you know, with the uh, our number one of our set general suggestion here is blend what you can. And if you think about, was it just yesterday or the day before, uh, UNC decided, oh my gosh, we're not going to do this face-to-face -face thing at all anyway. So they are immediately having to pivot the way that we did in spring to a remote slash online learning environment. So think about that as you plan for your courses in the next couple of weeks. Are there things that you can move to the online environment as a plan B? Can you break things up into smaller and smaller chunks so that you can quickly move them around and rearrange them as needed if something like that happens? Again, focusing on what are the outcomes and what are the different ways that we can reach those outcomes? And again, Ask your students because they have ideas and they are in more classes, so they've probably seen some idea that you'll never get a chance to see. So good. Any other points on that one? All right, let's talk about anxiety. You know, in some ways we're, we're doing that, um, and we, we, we've, we've sort of talked a little bit about that. But this is about being in a lab for an extended period of time. So are there reassurances um, about, and, and somebody can um, double uh, affirm or, or, or deny or add to this, but my understanding is that labs have pretty good PPE and um, ventilation in a standard situation, right? Throughout the year, pre-COVID. And I've also heard that the facilities is doing much more of an airflow exchange more than usual so there's that as well so some of these things are already you know you're already set um, but for an extended period of time i don't know other thoughts yeah this is blair again i can jump in on that so um, in my role leading this this field and clinical re-engagement team, there's a lot of um, questions that are coming in to the instructional continuity at Provost email, particularly. Yeah, so those are coming into Steve Kramer and Mo Bischoff, and and a, a major theme of that coming out of the town halls are this idea of you know. I'm anxious about re-engaging in these face-to-face -face activities. And one of the things that we've been doing to respond to instructors with those concerns is, first, we're directing them to materials that really explain how the virus is transmitted and how to mitigate that. So a lot of that are right there in the healthy teaching and learning activity sheet. So last week, um, Jessica Sebula, um, was a part of one of the active teaching labs. And there's a resource that she and her team, along with members of my team, have put together that really explain how the virus is transmitted, right? Sort of like the fundamentals of the virus. The other thing that we've been doing is via that website, um, that, that the instructional continuity website is, we are putting point people to respond to instructors that have those concerns. So for example, this was a question that came up in physical therapy where students have to engage with one another physically, right? That's a part of what they do in physical therapy is it's you, you actually have to touch. So you can't do the six feet of physical distancing. But there are steps that you can take uh, with the PPE to help mitigate the transmission. And then we've also had point people from 
other disciplines, in this case, the School of Nursing, instructors there who are doing similar activities are reaching out to other departments and kind of sharing best practices. And I think that goes a long way to help reduce the anxiety because the nursing folks have already been re-engaged in these kinds of physical, you know, touching the people. Um, just to just to be able to do the kinds of the licensure type activities that students are required to do. So I think having people being able to talk to one another across campus and share best practices is very reassuring and helps mitigate some of that anxiety. All right, we're going to learn from the School of Medicine and Public Health about their practices. That sounds like a good one too. All right, other thoughts on, okay, yeah, the anxiety doesn't come from a lack of understanding, but it is about a lack of behavior, or at least partially, I imagine, if I'm reading the, the dichotomy of having a, a, a shield, shield plus while the students do not, it's the, it's the student behavior. Is that, would you say that that's a big chunk of it? And Angela, feel free to, to unmic and, and, and uh, jump in if you like. But I, I, I'm hoping, and, and I know that the students are having a, a training on uh, being healthy and having healthy practices. I know that they are required to take the, the bad pledge, um, which we've uh, linked to in that healthy teaching and learning activity sheet um, in last week's lab. I guess there's a big question of, and I, I, the anxiety I imagine comes from, will they do it? or will they not do that? And if they don't do that, that makes things unsafe for me. So yeah, go ahead, Angela. Yeah, just to add to that, I guess kind of a science joke. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're trying to clone, do a cloning experiment, the joke is that, oh, it only takes one positive clone to, to get your success, and now you have what you need to continue your experiment. So I think it's hard with the messaging you know, obviously none of you here are responsible, but the messaging of trying to explain how the virus is transmitted when we know that it's more, it's an uncontrolled situation as much as we want to pretend that we have control. And even if 99% of your students are great, you know, it just takes one or a handful or some low percentage who aren't paying as much attention to cause problems. And then I think the flip side of that, particularly for people who do have a lot of teaching experience, whether that's in a regular classroom or in a lab or clinical setting, it's so hard. There's so many things you're thinking about in terms of like in a lab, you have to move equipment around or help a student. And so knowing you also have to pay attention to this other factor, I think is really anxiety creating because we yeah, I mean, and then of course there's just like worrying about, so it's just this constant low level anxiety that in my case keeps spiking. I'm sure other people have experienced that too, but you know, just knowing it's not a controlled ex ex uh, situation makes it kind of terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and I've got a question for for Amber or Blair that maybe, maybe you know the answer to. I'm thinking of um, keep calm and carry on or loose lips sink ships or other sorts of propaganda, that, you know, famous famous posters famous propaganda posters. Um, will the labs have reminders, these sort of, you know, hang on before you move that piece of equipment with your student, you know, here's a way to do it safely or, you know, think about ways to do that safely because I think, I think uh, Angela, the, that you, you bring up a really good point about as instructors, a lot of these things are sort of automatic, right? We, we don't think about helping somebody out because we, of course, we'll help somebody out. And we just sort of naturally do that. But we have to stop and think about what's the safe way to to do this. And the students have to have that as well, right? So it, it feels like it's going to be a constant emphasis. And if it's a constant emphasis, then it becomes a constant reminder of you need to be anxious, you need to be worried. And that can interfere with uh, the learning, I think, in a big way but it's also part of the reality. Yeah, mindfulness. That's good. Yeah, all right, and JT. All right, everybody, add to this your learning outcome for the semester. Focus on smart, safe behavior practices in 
whatever it is that you teach. That needs to be like the number one, right? Above well, the content. Even... Oh, yeah, really... go ahead. It's... Well, I hope you don't read that flippantly. I was just sort of saying, you I'm know, not... in a lab, you just can't really, you know, do, what, do whatever you want. I was sort of thinking of the comment that Margaret made a little bit earlier in the chat. You know, this is also um, mastery of instructional methods and tools, and all of those, you know, tools, lab equipment are a part of the lab itself. So just emphasizing that. But I don't know, it, it does read more flippantly than I had intended that. I, do I didn't read it as flippant. I, I, I read it as really insightful that, yeah, safety first. And that's always been a thing in labs, right? But in this case, it's, it's, it's a different kind of safety. And these are different practices that we need to really emphasize. And this semester, you know, even if it's not part of the course outcomes in the course catalog, it needs to be a number one course outcome is get through the semester safely, because if you don't, then you're not going to get through the semester at all. Other thoughts from folks? All um, right. I could add, could I add something? Yeah. Um, so I guess there's just a lot of value, I believe, in being transparent with students about this anxiety. You're feeling it as an instructor, they're maybe feeling it in their various roles too. And I think that, um, you know, yes, there's the city first, and I think that's how we can maybe bolster and try to cut through the anxiety. But um, it kind of comes back to something you said earlier, like to, to bring some generosity and compassion if a student is, you know, not on their top game or acting you know, not as you would normally have them be, it, it might just be like they're responding in a way that uh, to sort of the, the bigness or the trauma of the situation, and maybe they're not trying to not follow rules to just be deviant or anything. So I guess just a, a general reminder that I think some transparency around saying that like, yeah, this is kind of anxious for me too, but one thing that helps me is I go through a checklist of you know, do I have my mask? Have I sanitized? Or whatever it is, like something to model for the students how you're also getting through it. Oh, I think the, the, the idea of modeling will be a, a big part of that, especially in a lab situation. Um, and, and being open that um, in many ways, we're all making this up, right? There are, in many situations, there will not be a set protocol for doing the thing that you need to do or that you think you need to do. So make that part of the discussion. How do we do this safely? The students will, again, they're in a lot more classes than you are in, and um, they can bring ideas that other people are doing to your lab in a way that you would not be able to do um, through as many conversations that you could have with your colleagues. So enlist them, bring them into that conversation. Great. All right, we've got an answer for point people. Are there any other things that we need to say about that? I'm thinking not. Um, this question, what can and should students bring into lab? One of the questions um, that came up last week, for example, was how about food? You know, usually, um, students in face-to-face -face situations, they will bring in, you know, a can of Coke or a, a sandwich or whatever it is that they need. Are those, are there policies around that, um, Amber or Blair, um, that are, on, are they listed already on the instructional continuity site? I imagine that they probably are, that this is a thing that people have thought about. Food is not permitted in classrooms at all. Okay. And anything that the students do bring into the classroom, they are supposed to bring back out. So my understanding is that there are not garbage cans in the classroom as well. So it's kind of a pack in, pack out, only handle your own materials. Um, are there still lab notebooks? Those would be part of their their work or, or that they would bring with them. Um, uh, we are discouraging, I think, the idea of handouts. Um, unless you make the handouts, set them aside for a couple of days, and then um, put them in on, on, on a table and pass them out before the students get there, again, wearing gloves or whatever. Um, but 
again, safe practices. Are there other uh, specific ideas of uh, whoever wrote the question of, of what are the kinds of things that, that you were anticipating them bringing into the labs that we can address policies on that maybe Amber or Blair can? I wrote the question. I was just sort of thinking about students bringing in their own um, goggles or utensils or tools or. Okay. I don't know. I didn't do science in college, so I don't. My background yeah. in what's actually in the lab is coming from high school chemistry. So. And my understanding, you know, Amber and Angela and, and others that, that are in labs is that, that the students do bring in their own PPE and keep it with them throughout the semester. Yeah, I'm going to chime in and say that I think that probably varies depending on the lab course. Um, okay. And hopefully that's, I mean, I know that there's that's been in discussion in different places. Um, so I guess if you're an instructor on the call or supporting instructors, I think this is an important consideration. Um, I will draw your attention. It's not exactly to this question, but there are um, some guidelines about doing at home experiments on the lab course site. And the connection I see here is that the way that environment health and safety helped us to create this resource was a series of questions to reflect on what the potential harm is. And so it might be a way for instructors to view their own in person, you know, trying to think through what are places where students might inadvertently come in contact with shared supplies or that sort of thing. Um, so you're referring here to the lab course continuity resource database, is that correct? Um, that no, that, no? Uh, oh. no, that's that's a database that has you know simulations, data sets, okay. demonstrations, that sort of thing. Um, this is if you scroll down a little bit, there's a hazard identification and mitigation resources. Further down on the um, oh, on the activity sheet. Yeah. Apologies. No, it's okay. Um, Although that is that is a cool resource as well. So um, yes, I do have hope. It is good to, to share that. that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so again, this isn't this was meant for students doing experiments in their home. So it, it won't be a direct translation, but um, I do think that there's some good considerations for uh, just reflecting on what what sort of contact will students have with shared equipment. Um, you know, if they're all wearing gloves as you come in, you know, what are protocols? How is that different from spaces where students aren't wearing gloves? Um, I think it's great if they can bring in their own PPE, but in some cases that, you know, might not be appropriate or, or possible. All right. Very good. So, yeah, more, more opportunities for people to, to, to look at um, some of those ideas. Um, and if people have ideas, um, is there a campus place to sort of share ideas The teaching teams and individual instructors are coming up or is it is it is the only option this table here that I've we've put together here? So the, the lab team actually has a Google form that we've been trying to have instructors send us questions, specific scenarios or examples they need help with to provide resources so then we can push it back out through the instructional continuity website. Um, okay. I can certainly put that link here. Um, it, but that's that's a thing that's already been shared with instructors of labs? You've reached yes. out to lab instructors? Yep, so all fall lab instructors should have received this, but I can certainly post it here. I mean, folks didn't get that. Um, all right. But it's, you know, it's one of our big challenges. There's a lot of variation in these lab courses, so how do we get connected with the folks that really have questions about it? All right, where do I share ideas? And I'm going to just take that and copy and paste it in there. This form. Very good, thank you for adding to that. Good, 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 good. And JT's got a, a added a um, trick to get rid of your paper worksheets and turn them into digital ones right there. So that's a good trick. 
What about learning assessments for students who are quarantined? Okay, and we did talk about that step-by-step -step PDF that is on the instructional continuity site. So, um, and the idea of flexibility and uh, accommodation. So that's, we'll just leave that there. Um, how about resources for timing between student groups? And this is a question that came up last week in the healthy lab, um, sorry, healthy face-to-face uh, -face teaching that I didn't get an answer to as far as the scheduling. So maybe Blair or Amber, do you know, will there be um, cleaning between labs? Um, is there extra time where um, a lab will end a little bit earlier to give a, a 20 minute space or whatever so that students aren't passing each other in the doorway um, so they're not sitting down on the uh, stations right where somebody was previously. My understanding is that there will be um, wipes available, disinfectant wipes, and um, last week they said that students will be in face-to-face -face courses, which I anticipate um, also means labs, um, will be responsible for taking a, a, a wet wipe a disinfectant wipe at the you know as they walk in and going to their their table or, or desk and wiping it off and then I don't know how that works with the with the no garbage in the classroom but I'm sure that somebody's figuring it out so there is there is that at least but that doesn't address the timing and I, I wonder um, Blair or Amber if you've heard anything about timing yeah this is Blair again um you know, I haven't, my team hasn't been looking so much uh, at the classroom and the transition, and maybe maybe there is some language that either Jessica's team or Amber's team has looked at. Um, going back to the previous question about what should students bring, I feel is is very closely related to what we're talking about right now on, on the timing and sort of what are those protocols as students transition. And in the field and clinical most of that is up to the agencies and affiliations um, that we work with, right? So in a clinical setting, a lot of those protocols are established by the clinic uh, itself. So I don't know that, that the work that my team has been doing, which is so specific to these site placements, is applicable to the question of students transitioning from uh, one class to another, and I don't know if, if there has been that conversation that that Amber or others have been having um, in the in the classrooms or in in the labs. All right, and Amber says that she believes that classes were scheduled with facilities and these protocols. Um, so we'll we'll hope or hope so. Karen, go ahead. Yes, this is my question, and I teach uh, veterinary anatomy, so we, in addition to having uh, half the class, so 48 students, for four hours, um, one time a week. Uh, they would typically do a ton of sitting outside of class. And so we are thinking of having a Google sign-in form for Saturdays, but one concern is if you know, we have them in terms of they study for one hour and then there's that potential for many students to cycle through our lab and, and we just are not certain what kind of time frame we can talk about in terms of when a student works in an area for a period of time and wanders away. I mean, they, we are asking them to clean, but there will still be potentially that COVID cloud around them. And then the next group of students comes in and, to, and have 96 students have opportunity to study anatomy. It's difficult. So that's the kind of guidance I was seeking. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good one. Um, in last week's lab, I did hear about um, signage in the hallways where students will be instructed to keep moving and not linger so that they are not sort of hanging out in groups in the hallways. Um, I know that there are spaces, when I say I know that, let me, let me backtrack a little bit and say I've heard that there are spaces being considered or looked at where students um, can distance and sort of not work together, but places for those students who would be um, lingering in, in the hallway together to put them uh, so that they can be, so that they can linger in a, in a, in a safe and distanced way. Um, 
But I, again, I, I don't know the answers to the, a lot of these. So Karen, I, what this is there, I would offer that um, Jessica Sebula's team um, with the instructor safety would have the you know, better understanding of what's happening there. I think one thing you might want to check into is if you know something about the airflow in that classroom, I think that could also maybe determine what time is needed in between, you know, how, how quickly the air is turned over. Um, so if you want, though, um, I can get connected with Jessica and you and, and try to sort some of that out. So I can follow up with you in an email. Thank you. And I'm just going to put in the chat here. It's listed uh, on the doc activity sheet as well. But there's the activity sheet for uh, the health and safety lab that we had last week. So those are those are some things. All right. This is sort of the fun, sad one, right? In remote labs, can, can, can things be safe and fun? We play music. Can we chat? Um, a lot of this is going to be different, right? And again, we're, we're making things up. We're sort of exploring this territory for, ter ter for the first time. The good news is that humans are adaptable, and there will be ways to have fun in a physically distanced class. And I think a lot of when things work best, it's when they're working together, when people are working together, when everybody is playing. And I think that if you can get everybody playing along together with safe ideas and safe uh, ways, that 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 can be fun. So that's that's what I believe. I'm 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 an optimist that you can make that happen. All right. And what is the capacity limit for a formal class that is meeting outdoors? You know, I have not heard about the outdoor meeting, and I would love to invite anyone who has sort of field classes um, where you work outdoor. What's happening in those spaces? I imagine there's a little bit more leeway um, in the outdoor situation than there would be in a closed room. Um, but I'm sure that cautions are being taken. Are they being written up? Are there formal um, suggestions on that? I just remember uh, quite a few people asking at one of the town halls last week about um, using tents and being outdoors. There wasn't much information given in terms of what you can and cannot do in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, if you can make it work, um, go wild. Are there any instructors here who who, are, who do teach in a in a outdoor actual field space um, who are thinking about how things are going to go? All right. Well, I, I guess a lot of this is, is uh, to be determined, right? And the amount of time that we have to determine it is getting smaller and smaller. And so I imagine that the anxiety around what are the determinations will increase and increase. Um, but as with many things, we aren't going to know until, we aren't going to know for sure until we get into those spaces and figure things out. And that's going to depend on all of the instructors individually um, and with their students. Working together with the students, having these conversations with each other, other members of your teaching team, colleagues in different courses, um, colleagues in different institutions. How are they all handling things? Um, when you do come up with some good ideas, please do share that those ideas on that form that I'm highlighting in the active teaching, uh, activity sheet. And that way they can get distributed to other folks in campus. And hopefully we will have a semester that is successful and you know largely COVID free um, so that we can, you know, do the best thing that we can in, you know, so that we can do our jobs and the students can do their job of learning. Oh, I see in the, in, yeah, go ahead, Blair. 
Well, I didn't mean to cut you off, but one of the things that I was really curious about is, you know, you had asked the question earlier on about what is the motto, you know, you threw out the keep calm, carry on. And and one thing I was looking, trying to find, and I'm surprised it didn't come up, is where is the Badger Pledge information that students will be, that will be, I was looking on the Smart Restart, and I know that there's some language for students to really, you know, be aware of all of the the health and safety issues. Uh, does it? Does anybody have a, a link to that to that specific language? Because there might be something in there, John, that that kind of is close to what you were asking. Yeah, I, I I'll put the link right in the the chat right here. Five people got to it at the same time. Very Thank good. You, so everybody. there it is, three times. JT, Karen, and and, and I both shared um, what the students and I think. So I, I don't think that they're making the instructors do this. They're just encouraging the instructors to do this. But let me go ahead and share that page. All right, so prevent, monitor, reflect. Um, and I think that this part on reflection is going to be, well, it's all going to be um, ongoing, right? And it's all going to change and adjust and evolve as we um, find out more and more about what is this virus like in an actual class learning situation in, in higher education. Um, and that information is, 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 is coming out and it's going to come out in unfortunate ways in some, um, in some respects. So we're at two o'clock. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions if anyone has any I, or, or to continue chatting. Um, I suspect that Amber and Blair would be able to do that as well for at least a few minutes if somebody has a, a, a deep question that they don't want to answer together uh, or ask in public here. And uh, thank you all for being part of this and good luck, stay safe. And we're, tomorrow we're going to talk about um, inclusion and equity. So we're going to delve into the effects of the uh, racial tensions and with inclusion and equity in our classrooms and learning spaces. Come back tomorrow, 1 to 2 p.m., same place. I will be there instead of in a different room. I'm going to fix that right away. <laughs>